Thank you all guests for attending this online lecture and for HCU for hosting this great event. My name is Ziwar Nuri. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Repermetrite Studio and together with my partner and co-founder Bilal Badadi, we will be hosting this event tonight. I would like to short introduction about ourselves, a flow by introduction about our activity with HCU before we move to a great lecture by our special guest with this afternoon. We are Repermetrite Studio. Many people ask why it's repermetrized. What's the story behind this world? The world of repermetrizing closes our vision to regenerate the post-war disaster city into the most advanced urban environment on Earth. The important fact here is that the world does not mean rebuild or redevelop. We are not simplify bringing back lifeless structure and shelter back to life, being able to detect and analyze various parameters, physical structure, their condition, and operational capacity, etc., as well as emotional human behavior and expectation, change in need, etc., we are able to regenerate the city in a smarter way, not only by clever infrastructure, but also through the re-establishment of a human interaction. Repermetrite Studio is a global company with establishment in four countries, Syria, Lebanon, Austria, and China. Our global vision is to introduce a state of the art technology in the architectural discipline. These are our partner actually, which is like from each country. We all come from common background. We were part of the famous studio of Zaha Hadid and Patrick Schumacher in Vienna, and that's our team in Damascus. Our core competence lay in the field of artificial intelligence and smart city recently featured in Arc Daily. We are one of the first companies to apply 3D scanning and AI-driven data analysis, analytic methodology for post-war smart city redevelopment of Damascus, Syria. Recently, we have organized and co-hosted multiple international co-workshops like conferences and exhibitions in Europe, Middle East, and China. One of the highlights of 2019 was one of the, of course, I mean, the eye of the city, which it was in Shenzhen Benale, invited by Calorat Society, which showcased two years' worth of research and development over the post-war smart city development of Damascus, Syria. We brought the past, present, and future of the city right in front of our Chinese audience through sophisticated 360-degree projection mapping. Our vision, of course, goes beyond the redevelopment of the city of Damascus, and we are looking to be the next leader in post-disaster urban development, offering proprietary state-of-the-art technological solution for a smarter and more connected city. In April 2020, we were honored to co-host this exciting workshop with Haven University Hamburg together with Prof. Carson and Tutor Mahmoud Aine Cole Echo of Shidre, recording post-war Syria. This summer school is co-hosted by Repermetrize Studio and HCU, sponsored by GPU Jazeera Private University. The course aimed at creating an intervention at a specific site within the the sensitive and extraordinary context, providing a space for children to live by taking into account certain parameters, such as the remaining building structure, the use of alternative and the site-specific construction, material, and technique. This workshop, it has a, like a different, like several uh, aspects and phases, starting from the research, to the material, to the location, and starting uh, like doing the design and like the material which is starting doing like from the rubble and from the like the existing and traditional material. And for sure like how we can take like the, the psychology of the children and how it can reflect it to have it in the realistic. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our guest this afternoon. He's the head of one of the most famous architectural offices in the world and one of my personal mentors in the famous studio Zaha Hadid in Vienna, where me and my partners had the honor to serve ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to have with us the principal of Zaha Hadid architect, Patrick Schumacher. Patrick does not need an introduction. I will make one short one, but Patrick, he joined Zaha Hadid in 1988 and was seminal in developing Zaha to become a global architecture and design brand. Patrick Schumacher studied philosophy, mathematics, and and 
architecture in Bonn, Stuttgart, and London. He received his diploma in architecture in 1990. He has been a partner since 2003 and co-author of all projects. In 2010, Patrick Schumacher won the Royal Institute of British Architects Sterling Prize together with Zaha Hadid. In 1996, he founded the Design Research Laboratory at the Architecture Association in London, where he continued to teach. In 1990, he completed his PhD at the Institute for Culture Science. Over the last 20 years, he has contributed over 100 articles to architectural journal and anthology. In 2008, he coined the phrase of parametricism and has since published a series of manifestos promoting parametricism as the new ep epochal style for the 21st century. In 2010-2012, he published his two-volume theoretical opus, The Autopsies of Architecture. Patrick Schumacher is widely recognized as one of the most prominent through thought leaders within the field of architecture, urbanism, and design. Patrick, we are very happy to have you with us today, and th thank you very much for your time. And we would like, I mean, like to share now with you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, is is um, a pertinent, let's say, task domain where parametrism can show its um, potency, let's say. Um, so I've put together that, that presentation. So let me uh, try to share my screen, perhaps. Which bit should I share here? Wait. No, 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 no. So I wanted to start here. I'm not sure if you, probably you are familiar with this project. That's Berlin. And one of the great architects of modernism. This is post war Germany. In Berlin, the uh, so-called Gedächtniskirche, now called Memory Church. In Berlin, as you know, was in total rubble. And uh, so this was, this fragment here of a, uh, a really old church, Romanus church was, was left and preserved as a ruin and then uh, surrounded by very contemporary at the time structures from the 1950s, uh, Egon Eiermann. And I think that's an interesting proposition. You can see that the buildings encircle it and, and connect up uh, with the new tower and the beautiful new contemporary uh, space. So I think that's for me an interesting reference point for what I'm going to talk about, how I can integrate contemporary structures with old structures. And the preservation is oftentimes has more to do with cultural memory than with the best use cases. But we wouldn't want to, even in, an, in, an, in a condition where you have a city in rubble, you don't want to, you know, use that moment and, and erase everything. So, and don't build on top of. So that's one, one uh, signature image I, for me in this context. By the way, I couldn't find more images of that, but we also, we actually did the kind of temporary, a beautiful uh, tensile uh, school structure um, as a prototype for Syrian refugee camp at the at the border with Turkey, and I don't have more images of that. Um, um, but it's kind of very bright and, and I think beautiful beautiful space with a, with a with some kind of arcade on one side and overhanging roof structures also to the outside to create shaded spaces and skylight. Uh, so I don't have more on that. Um, so here, I think looking at the deeper origins of what we're now doing in parametricism, in deconstructivism, and even in Cesar, even OMA, when she worked with OMA, uh, it's at the, the edge of the, of the transition from postmodernism into deconstructivism. And postmodernism, to some extent, is already that um, uh, first um, critique going beyond this kind of tabula rasa modernism and working with concepts of collage, of juxtaposition, of allowing new uh, to be integrated with old and interesting ways. And the modernists did that partly, but this is, this is a very conscious 
very interesting project of layering new and old. This is from the 1978 when Zaha was working on that competition for the, the Hague a government complex in Holland with um, Rem Kolas, Elias and Gallas and Orme. By the way, can you hear me properly? Okay. I feel somehow the, the, the connection isn't isn't very good. Um, I feel like uh, uh, switching off my uh, image, maybe. Let me try that. Um, I can't hear you, by the way. Okay, we can't hear you, uh, Herr Schumacher. We cannot hear me. Doch, doch. We are hearing. Okay, 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 good, good, good. I just felt there's something. Go ahead, just go ahead. Okay, okay. good, good, good. So, so, so that's another kind of signal moment of in the history of architecture, actually. And uh, and then when Zaha made herself independent, right, this is within Trafalgar Square. So the audacity to put in something highly contemporary, highly porous and open on one of the blocks at the time, competition called Grand Buildings. And I think we are connected to Hamburg here. So I've joined the office in the late 80s and this was one of the first projects I was working on. And this is actually Hamburg Hafenstraße and the integration of into an existing uh, line of houses. And I suspect these gaps were also maybe remnants of the war. Uh, there's simply these gaps in an old uh, line of houses on the, on the um, Elbe. And we, we proposed this kind of cluster of new slabs, making porous, making open, and then a kind of twisted edge build. And um, well, you guys from Vienna, <laughs> The class, the Hadid class, knows um, what we did here. And here's a kind of new set of actually social or affordable housing structures straddling across um, a former railway arches or a viaduct, uh, which is now used for um, some shops, etc. And on top is a bicycle pass. So this idea of collaging, of integrating all the new I show you many examples because I think that's very important. And that could be the spirit of going back into a place like uh, Damascus or Aleppo and any other of those cities, which are highly scarred. And there's an opportunity to, to layer old onto new, uh, sorry, new onto old. Maxi is a, is, a, is a strong example of that, of course. They're also reintegrating the old spaces. You can see here, uh, this is directly integrated. This is used as part of the institution. And the whole, all, there's a kind of conversion of these, uh, of the whole district and former military and industrial barracks to become a new layer, cultural layer on top of um, this industrial layer. Um, we've also done that, uh, many, so many projects. This is the Odobgard. Museum, where it's an extension onto a classical uh, building, which had started, had a first extension, now has a second extension. And the integration of parametricism is you know, the ability to pick up and align with, and attach to, and lay onto existing structures, and then affiliate also with respect to more softer forms that landscapes and irregular sites. I think is important. And uh, there's so many examples, uh, you know, they're gonna have hugging of an old, uh, smaller concert hall building in Basel for a new concert hall extension. Um, this didn't go ahead. We won the competition, but, but popular vote <laughs> killed the project. Um, and uh, yeah, so many examples of, I mean, I'll show you some projects nobody might have seen of you know, old competitions. This is in Marseille in the harbor, directly connecting into an old uh, fortress, medieval fortress or in a Baroque time fortress with a structure. 
our proposal to go with the new Islamic Museum, ex I mean, part of the Louvre into one of the old um, the Renaissance courtyards. Of course, we've gone ahead with um, converting and also reutilizing the old ammunition storage to create a beautiful contemporary gallery in, in, in Hyde Park. And then we made that social space extension, very lightweight structure. And it's also interesting the way it kind of picks up uh, and allows the old building to enter into a symbiosis or connection with the new and then, then not be afraid to have something super contemporary uh, to, to, to make for an interesting fusion project. Uh, similarly, the, the approach with the Center for uh, Middle Eastern Studies in part of Oxford University, St. Anthony's College, is actually going to kind of win one a prize for uh, exemplary heritage projects. So the, there's a new library bridging between the old um, Gothic like on uh, um, um, uh, school buildings and also uh, swinging around making space for a tree. So, so, so it's exemplary in terms of feminism, the openness of the composition, the, the fluidity, flexibility of, of, of taking shape uh, in a very irregular condition and allowing um, a tree to exist and then affiliate to that with the structure even to some extent, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we love these projects. This this is this is very germane to the, the principles of parametricism and the capacities of parametricism. Um, also going then down into the underground and making further connections there. This is a very recent project in Austria and Graz. And it's, it's been a struggle because a lot of people worry about heritage and one, the way one deals with old ensembles. So this took 15 years to get planning permission in Graz because it, it's in the old city and directly attaches to the Baroque fabric. And, and that makes it also very precious. And it's a kind of uh, type and variation 17 um, individual volumes, to each, um, sorry, 27, um, each individually tailored and uh, for small scale temporary accommodation. And uh, that's a kind of beautifully set into this very fabric of the old city of Graz. And uh, so the top is actually a pentos of the owner. So, it's, so some of these are fusing to a larger units as well. And again, another thing is, you know, this a very complex site in Seoul and this amoeba shape integrating and allowing to overhang actually um, archaeological digs and remains, as well as picking up different directions and integrating with an old city wall uh, it's a beautiful symbiosis with a lot of interesting outdoor spaces that like occupy the roofs, etc. And this kind of layering of different materials, the old um, uh, city wall, the concrete wall, the new kind of lightweight aluminum translucent wall, etc. And integrating uh, archaeological remains in the outdoor spaces. So these are things, examples which uh, are pertinent to, to any reconstruction effort. And, and th there's many of those, some of them are built um, in the city of Riga, uh, transforming an old industrial estate and literally going on top and appropriating uh, existing structures and extending with a new courtyard and existing courtyard, etc., cetera, and, and then utilizing some of those industrial spaces I mean, beautifully. That's also what we have at certain and second, we have such space as well. So we're not shy. And, uh, and I think it, it's, it's a better way to integrate and, and, and let's say repair city fabrics than a kind of more literal reconstruction effort. Like you found, I will talk later, but in Beirut, you have a, a lot of this kind of uh, reconstruction more in a traditional sense 
but they also allowed some new projects in there. I won't have an image of that, but we, we're building a, um, a retail, some retail structures there, maybe contemporary into the old fabric of Beirut. Um, and Beirut has been incredibly resilient to all its uh, historical setbacks. And this is Riga. Just throwing this in, I mean, you don't have to talk about New York. New York is, a, is the ultimate collage of all time, of everything layered on top of everything. And you can still have a kind of sense of local affiliation. Some of our projects in this respect are more dramatic. Sorry. Uh, integrating uh, with the courtyard, uh, all the new, the new harbor offices for the harbor, the harbor of Antwerp. But you also needed a kind of strong gesture. And in fact, we're on axis. And if you had, if you had the uh, the short elevation, you, you would, if you have exactly kind of substituted the originally designed um, bell tower, nearly, of, which was which was planned on top. So we are also careful in terms of um, when we think about these 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 kind of otherwise strange syntheses, and I mean the latest um, of those. Sorry, I I got uh, I have something I might have to repair here. No, oh, strange. It's don't know what that is. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So, so this is one of those sites which is very typical, um, and you don't need a war to, 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 to deliver kind of fragmented city blocks. Um, this is in Yekaterinburg, and so this is going to be demolished. This will stay um, a cultural building. And then we're partly filling this um, garden space with a new um, concert hall. So the existing structure is nearly embedded in a big roof. Main entrance here. Um, the garden is maintained and the main hall and the secondary hall overlooking the garden. So that's the main entrance stepping in and I mean these kind of spaces you simply cannot have in a traditional building and that's what why we have to think about these kind of layers sorry this is killing me um, wow. Okay, maybe that helps. <laughs> so this is one of those <laughs> projects. This is an old city wall in Nicosia with old city wall structures. And we're designing a whole a new bridge as a plaza as a and a whole park condition under construction. Uh, very fluid, very contemporary. And again, the, 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 the ability for our designs to flow into these gaps to affiliate and hack spaces and become a um, a synthesis between old and new very fluid very adaptive uh, affiliative and oh, I can't believe this I don't know what's wrong with this presentation I mean there's This is crazy. Uh, Patrick, I think you need to click apply to all in the end. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe. Wait, let me try something else. Ah. 
Hello. Hello. I'm back. Sorry, guys. So let me try to share again. Uh, this one. Patrick, there was a quick suggestion from the audience that maybe yeah. you save it as PDF so uh, you don't get into trouble again because there's sometimes problems with it. But yeah, but, well, good one, good one. Let's, I do that by the next time. Next time we have an issue. I hope not. <laughs> I should have done that, yeah. I just put it together. So, so, so this is the project in, in Cyprus. And uh, so, but also I thought what might be relevant is something which we're studying is uh, modular construction, small units. This is for the purpose of um, so-called co-living with very small units, micro units, and a lot of shared spaces, courtyard spaces, shared space, etc. This is something we studied in, for London in this case, but you can imagine that we be very interesting uh, for an initial rapid deployment and reconstruction effort. And uh, so, so this is a way, but and to make it not kind of just a rough container city, to make it elegant in the details and have degrees of variation in that. So that's the concept we, we put forward for the collective here in London. Super small units, they're literally 10 square meter. So <laughs> they're very, very quick and fast. And uh, but it has a lot of outdoor spaces, shared spaces, and courtyard zones, etc. And we also did something. So this was meant to be permanent. Eventually, we also created this uh, idea of containers, which are nearly kind of stacked more loosely for uh, along the Regents Canal in London. It's there's a lot of temporary sites that take time for planning, two, three, four, five years sometimes, uh, stuck in planning. So. <laughs> Maybe one can get a temporary planning permission for something like that along the canal or elsewhere. And uh, we did we did some similar concept for Hong Kong student housing. So I think this this might be an appropriate um, technique. And again, you, you you they don't have to be absolutely rectilinear at all times. Uh, there could be kind of mass customization agenda together with modularity, a kind of mass varied modularity con concept. Um, now. So the next stage of the, the, the talk, I wanted to show um, some of our pro projects within the Arab world and how one can be contemporary but yet have cultural sensitivities uh, with respect to um, aesthetic affiliations uh, with, with the landscape, climatic uh, responses as well. So this is our Dirium Museum project. I mean, the old city of Dirium in uh, outside Riyadh is a beautiful kind of mon historical monument. And as Saudi Arabia has opened up, uh, they want to kind of open that up to tourism. And they, they wanted to have a, a visitor center uh, with lecture halls and museums and restaurants, a kind of uh, service point. And that's the museum right there. And uh, so it tries to be sensitive somehow with kind of mood and, and forms uh, with the surrounding. Uh, I also wanted to show this, which is um, the Syrian's People Assembly. So, and then generally, I want to say that, I mean, the, the war which is happening in Syria is a tragedy and what happened and, um, it was interesting, I was in, in, when Arab Spring happened, um, Zaha, and we were, we were, you know, a lot of people were enthusiastic about the prospects and Zaha was very apprehensive uh, about the unrest and about the, let's say, um, impatience and hopes and the way this was cheered on as well. Um, and uh, in actual fact, I would now say the period just prior to that was now called the Arab Spring was the real Arab Spring. Uh, because what we have witnessed oh, is in fact, the, the particular period between the financial crisis 2008 
where Dubai, the, the kind of initial, let's say, um, symbol of hope for the Arab world that, that the, you know, from the Middle East, it could come a, a, a truly first world city and metropolis and society. Um, that was, I think, uh, was, was a great signal to a lot of other Arab countries and to the world that there's a development potential in the Middle East, uh, in the Arab world. And particularly after 2008, what we, uh, where we lost a lot of our projects, I'm not showing those, all the great Dubai and Abu Dhabi projects, uh, that was put on hold. But in fact, there was a real take of right after in uh, other parts of the Middle East, in fact, uh, uh, all along the North African edge coast there, including, but also, you know, so we got involved with Syria, we got involved with I will show you later things, Morocco, Algeria, um, you are involved with um, um, Libya, with, with, with also with Lebanon, with virtually with and, uh, Jordan. The whole region was uh, in a moment of takeoff and boom and embracing development, capital inflows, foreign capital. There was an affluence, Egypt as well, very, very strongly. And we were active in all of these regions and we have, you know, and a lot of the, let's say, um, diaspora of the Arabs, people who have been coming from these countries and studying abroad and developing their skills and, and outlook, you know, we were eager to come back to, to deliver some of these projects, help with these projects. So, so this is the first one I wanted to show because we're talking about them. Syria as well here. Uh, the People Assembly, and it's again, you know, it's it's in the old city of Damascus, and we visited Damascus, the fantastic, beautiful city with amazing um, uh, the old mosque and the old city. This was fantastic, and this is the existing kind of end, the new hall. A series of courtyards surrounding that. In fact, you have a kind of lobby space here, and uh, the um, the administrative offices for the for the for the members of parliament uh, along here. So I think it was an interesting and strong project, which we uh, developed at the time. Um, I don't remember the exact year, but it's between 2008 and 2011. In that period, we did a lot of these kind of projects. Um, so, so this is, and you can see that we're trying to do something contemporary. I call it parametric regionalism, where, where we're working with geometric features, with using the, the shading, but then looking at, you know, Arab mashrabiya patterns and try to use, uh, uh, turn these into structures, etc. cetera. So it's trying to be sensitive. And you can also see it's adaptive. It is able to work with irregular sites and integrate elegantly. Um, and and create a kind of a contemporary incision into an old fabric which is congenial and um, at the same time cont very contemporary. So so this obviously didn't didn't go anywhere. Uh, so many things on on and this was meant to be the main hall. So again, it has a kind of a festive and I think not scientifically, but intuitively affiliated with using cultural um, expectation and reference to make that uh, a, a institution of its place, connected up with 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 the with the origin and the great traditions of Arab and Islamic architecture. So, so that was that was a proposal uh, we we put forward at the time. Um, probably nobody's ever seen that, <laughs> and there's, uh, there are many others. So, so I don't have all the images of that, but this is uh, the great people's hall for Tripoli in Libya. As you know, the uh, Libyan political system is 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 unusual. It's a kind of direct democracy of sorts, 
with 5,000 delegates on Zuni, massive, massive assembly hall. I don't have the image of the hall, but there's literally 5,000 people hall, uh, very unusually large for parliament, and a series of side spaces, etc. Uh, so that was, a, we've actually developed several versions of that. Um, and uh, this is again one of those examples where we had, you know, people who, um, I mean, Saif Gaddafi, in fact, at the time, was a modernizer and got involved and brought a lot of great architects and a lot of young professional Libyans back to the country. So it was a, is a, is a great moment of, of, let's say, take up and hope in all these uh, countries. And Zaha was very, very, let's say, happy to get involved in all these projects and meeting with uh, the, 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 the leaders and the, the young generation to, to, to deliver that. And so this was another version on the outskirts. So this is this was directly on the waterfront in, in Tripoli. And then this is a larger complex of ministry buildings with various assemblies and parliament buildings. And this idea of a big plate with courtyards connecting all of that and the pedestrian connection on top. So so very forward looking project for uh, Libya. Uh, again, the what I call the real Arab Spring. Um, just examples of this. And again, these projects are very old and we've never published them. That's why I, 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 <laughs> I couldn't, I would have to dig deeper into our archive to find a, a proper, make a proper presentation of these works. Uh, what did come out positively, of course, was the, um, and this actually on site, uh, but also stemming from that, period is the Iraqi um, central bank directly on the on the Tigris and it's a very I think beautiful project and you can see here the the, the, the vaults and then very much emphasizing that we wouldn't in such a climate to put up a kind of slick mirror glass tower but what would, would have a deep relief and a strong shading at the back of the tower totally um, closed and very open to the front, to the river, with an atrium and uh, kind of navigation space to such a town. So it's a very beautiful, I think, and very proud and happy that this is actually under construction at the moment and will go forward. We also did at the time, and you can see the feeling, this kind of arabesque, this kind of lightness using shells, using something which fits the region, picks up traditions intuitively. This was a proposal for the, um, Prime Minister and uh, the executive cabinet offices for Baghdad, also on the river. And you see kind of semi-classical arrangements with the, with the primary uh, a courtyard and access, but also very open and integrated into kind of park scape. Again, I only have that model image. There's more beautiful, very light weight, uh, high performance shells which we're using. And we also made the proposal for uh, the Iraqi parliamentary complex with multiple chambers and offices in a park. That's also been uh, accepted, uh, but it will really take longer to uh, to really find the funds and make it happen. So, so that's in thinking, in process, um, still not yet shelved altogether. So with a big podium and multiple uh, halts, um, all connected up in the multi-chamber uh, parliament for Iraq in Baghdad. And this is where you look back at it from the offices. And, you know, the very ambitious projects, of course. And um, it's, uh, similarly, so it's a lot of political projects. Uh, this is the part uh, um, the parliament building also for a, um, a Gulf state, I think this was Dubai at the time, uh, with, the, with a beautiful chamber and a series of lines of domes and arcades with offices. You know, sometimes the multi-story offices within this and a big shading arcade in front and the main hall as a beautiful kind of layered um, hall that light would also filter into. Uh, also at the time, uh, and of course, 
all of these projects got halted in Egypt, the new Expo City. Um, in the old Cairo, because for various reasons, partly, I guess, also political, a lot of the, the new development is new Cairo, and now the government goes all the way out to kind of new, new Cairo. This was actually within the old city, right next to the so-called city of the dead. Um, and I think it was, uh, we worked not only the competition, we went, we worked it all the way through and ready to, to, to tender when Arab Spring hit and stopped these kind of developments, uh, some of the images. And uh, at the same time, we were developing what was at the time our largest project by far, total square meter, one million and meant to be developed in one go. It's connect up into new Cairo with, with uh, this kind of valley of office space, office towers for multinationals. Um, we call it stone towers that has kind of affiliation to some of the kind of rock formations. And uh, it was, it was a, you know, there's two slabs always connecting around an atrium, so they open from the inside. And there's a lot of variations of that, a lot of strong shading elements. And um, but this was the first time we explored what we laid on it in the Miami Tower, a fiber concrete sandwich uh, filled with on-site concrete to make a kind of solid structure. So that's where we developed that. And again, it's, it has a, you know, a big conferencing area, hotel, a lot of retail area. And um, it was all kind of lined up and approved and detailed to the nth degree. I mean, we have 3D, we have BIM models of everything ready to go. So you can see the tragedy and, and shame that all of that was stopped um, by what we call the Arab Spring. But I think, again, this was the real Arab Spring. Uh, and it, I understand, I mean, this is a, really a problem with, you, with, with the political dynamics. When this money started flowing in and it showed up and suddenly you have, not everybody is involved initially. And um, you get this kind of tension, you get maybe impatience and you have, and, and, and you kind of one have and it, this kind of initial, it's very strange that, you know, you have the revolution at the moment of takeover, when you actually have development, when actually resources and funds are flowing in and that excites the counter movement. You know, rather than um, than than you had decades of relative, uh, you know, stagnation before, because it was also, you know, like most of these countries, all of the developing countries started on the wrong foot with under kind of a socialist, uh, quasi statist trajectory, and 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 only recently we had we had the kind of globalization and opening up market processes, and that stirred up that resistance, and it's a it's a big shame. And um, we kind of felt uh, when this was uh, all celebrated, Zaha knew this is not going to end well. But we did obviously <laughs> manage to get something on the ground as well in, in Beirut. And again, it's kind of into historical context, actually where Zaha herself was, was a student in the, in the 70s. We did the beautiful uh, Ferris, uh, political think tank, Institute of Political Research. Uh, we don't have many images of it right now, but it sets beautifully into the into the into the campus of uh, AUB Beirut. Uh, it has a lot of beautiful in indoor space. There's a beautiful terrace uh, on top as well as the in front, etc. And uh, so at the time, it was really Arab Spring. We had, um, you know. Morocco, we did this competition, which we, uh, uh, for Casablanca, a new concert hall with two halls. So these were the kind of projects all over the place. It was, it was kind of what you'd seen in Dubai 2006, seven, eight. We now saw all, all across um, 
um, let's call it, you know, uh, the Arab North Africa uh, in 2009, 10, up to 11. Uh, Amman, we got the, I mean, it's a tragedy again. We had the beautiful grand theater um, set into the, into the in, as, you know, former factory big site. Fully, this is the competition sketches, but these are fully designed, uh, ready for tender uh, documents. We worked after the competition two full years on this and everything is ready. Everything is ready to go, beautiful uh, theater. But at the time, even though Jordan wasn't affected directly, it was felt that um, the, it would be not political viable to go ahead with a project which might be con considered an elite project, an expensive project. So that's why this was canceled. Uh, even though we went to John, we went to um, Amman and met also with the um, uh, with the mayor of Amman and and the um, the royal family as well in Morocco as well. So so this is another of those of those um, let's say beautiful projects. I think we need to get back to the stage, and I hope the lessons have been learned. Um, so, but we were lucky with this project. So, so um, this is Morocco, Rabat, uh, the the opera house, which which uh, is actually happening. Beautiful, located on the water with various terraces and beautiful lobby spaces, and amphitheater. Uh, that's where the stage is operating in outdoor and an indoor uh, theater, and. Um, so, so this is what the design was, and this is what's happening. I mean, these are not latest images, but integrating fair-faced concrete with fiber concrete, uh, mostly on the on the exterior, and then on the interior we have we have other materials, um, uh, silk fabrics, and 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 others. So we we further ahead than this, but so um, yeah, at least um, this project is 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 seeing the. Uh, the light of day. Now, one of the most interesting projects at the time, which we started at that period, was um, the Algerian presidential palace, and that continued for many years. And finally, it didn't happen because um, Bouteflika, uh, the president who was championing, that was passed away. There's a kind of parametric regionalism where we have these kind of shell structures we've been working, inspired by some of the Candela, but making them more um intuitively fitted into a uh, and fitted with arabic sensibilities and examples and islamic architecture the presidential residence the presidential palace series of courtyards and a series of very very large shells with major major spaces a lot of arcades and pros festive procession zones etc um so that's uh, these are kind of nested and there's always a gap for light to pour through and uh, they're, they're kind of anti-classical or optimized forms particularly when it comes to the ribbing and perforations we used uh, you know primary stress analysis caramba all these parametric tools and these were high performance concrete shell but a with the kind of i call it you know parametric regionalism with with, with heightening the the tectonic uh, patterns into ornaments to, to, to characterize and rank the degree of festivity and a beautiful atria as well coming through uh, with these kind of cluster columns and the different sensibilities for the various spaces um, quite light quite open transparent and <laughs> nearly kind of sac sacred feeling uh, big 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 halls uh, like this, and a lot of attention also to the very, very large uh, glass facades and their, and their structure. And you know, I, f I feel this is this kind of monuments are beautiful and um, worthy to to be erected, even in a country which is relatively poor, because everybody can enjoy the pleasure and coming and visiting and maybe um, enjoying the gardens. And that's what I felt when, when we did this at the same time I was in 
um, Iran. We actually also had a number of projects going on there, which were stopped by sanctions. Uh, and looking at Isfahan and the beautiful uh, palaces and mosques there, and the and the, the for centuries, centuries and centuries of pleasure and urban luxury for the poor who will actually live in shanty towns around Isfahan, coming to these places and 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 enjoying the the splendor and beauty of of their of their palaces. So that's what I was thinking about trying to justify this this kind of incredible effort. Um, and this is the the maybe the project which we've never designed, let's say, more intensely uh, to the nth degree of detail, and where every space, every corner is a sculpture, nearly. And of course, you can do that with parametric models and algorithms. And you can kind of match up with the best examples of historical architecture where you have this kind of coherency and beauty and of craftsmanships, um, which took sometimes centuries to execute. Uh, we can maybe do that quicker, but unfortunately this was not uh, continuing. Now I want a few images more. We, we actually also, I don't know how relevant this is to Syria in terms of mosques, that I was very much impressed by the Grand Mosque. And we wanted to show you a few of our mosque designs. And to show that, I mean, Islam uh, could acquire a kind of, it could maintain its, its, its rituals, but also have, I mean, acquire a different image, a more contemporary uh, uh, light and, and image. Kind of reformed Islam, perhaps, and uh, in an if you it is you know if a society accepts this kind of translation uh, of their uh, religious site, that would mean a lot. And if you, and it made me think about uh, Europe in the 1950s. And I showed you the church. I started with the church of Ayaman. You look at all the the churches, and there was still a very very religious Europe in the 1950s, and that only changed radically late 60s early 70s you you get all these beautifully beautifully modern contemporary uh, i mean at the time contemporary church design so that's something which inspired us as well for for doing um uh, contemporary high technology parametric driven uh, designs for the great kind of public spaces which are still the religious spaces in in the arab world so i'm just going to go through uh, some of those and uh, so we did several versions of this of this one here. I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but um, and these are these are tectonism exercises and exercises in 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 parametric variation um, inspired by people like Ramazzi etc. And I think that's that's something we can do now, and we can do it um, without excessive costs um, using robotic fabrication. So this was the third version of um, what we wanted to propose. Very light, the the big kind of canopy uh, courtyard and the and the and the double dome, if you like. And the integration of you know, consideration of lighting, etc. And and just a few more. We had uh, I was recently also and I've been a number of times in Tirana, and uh, still an Islamic country, but uh, much less, let's say, religious, if you like, and. They're still, they wanted to build a mosque at the central square, integrate into an urban fabric, and we can do things like this. We can fit our architecture into um, complex sites. This is actually a main prayer hall here. 
and this is the minaret, and this is the courtyard in front. And so a very non-traditional approach, but in the end, in the prayer hall, also very kind of beautiful um, space. And then access to the balcony is very contemporary again. And finally, I want to stop with maybe uh, Kosovo, uh, Pristina, uh, also a city which had its kind of, let's say, uh, struggles and fights. And uh, the idea of a mosque there. So, so this is kind of a very rugged place. You can see here the idea of a swarm of domes, the minaret. And the way we were looking at this, they like in a very fluid swarm. So there's still the kind of structured uh, dome within that, courtyards in front. So the features and elements are there, arcades. And in fact, also kind of bazaar condition here, retail condition directly integrated. I think that's also beautiful in terms of these Arabic conditions of mosques and bazaars and urban fabric kind of all woven together and tied together. Um, and the idea of these kind of walls and the light which can pour through them and the way that just the kind of parametric swarm, it's not afraid to make the individual domes kind of stretch and morph uh, when, 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 when the building attaches itself, becomes more mundane, if you like. The model at the time, um, And again, um, picking up uh, irregular site conditions, uh, diagonal trajectories, etc., and 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 allowing the elements to adapt and deform in a kind of parametric variation, but being based on a base module. A little sketchy, of course. This was a competition sketch we we, we did. We, we still kind of like it. Some of the uh, the edge condition with maybe with cafes, bars, restaurants, retail. Um, a lot of public shaded zones, and uh, you can also see that there was a level of difference to to navigate, and all of that is possible under kind of parametric regionalism, if you like. Some glimpses that it may. Uh, at, 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 at a space, interior space. So I think that that's it for now. I mean, um, oh, what I've prepared. And uh, wait. Yes. Hey, Patrick. Thank you very much. I mean, like... so I, I just, uh, it's my pleasure, guys. So uh, I don't, I'm, I'm going to try to un, unshare, but I don't see the button right now. Um, uh, it's up. Uh, stop share. I see it now. Yes. Okay, now I got it. Now I got it. So thank you very much. I mean, like it's super nice and super interesting. I mean, like for sure. I mean, for all of us. I mean, like it's a pleasure. Especially, I mean, like to be honest. I mean, like that's. I mean, that's as a person. I mean, that's my dream. I mean, like for that reason, like how we can get this science and this thinking like to the post-war city. But I mean, like just I want to have like one question. Actually, I mean, like because I have it a lot. I mean, since I have it like to the investor, I have it to the people. Like I have it everywhere. Regard to the cost estimation, I have this answer. I mean, like in my mind, I know. I mean, the cost estimation, like it's like has the added value of the optimization and this stuff and these things. I mean, like parametric. Like when you just study, I mean, like it's it's like regard to the future. It's more a cost estimation for us. But I mean, like in general, like for the material, for the fabricating, everything. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, what the way we work usually um, you, is um, share your screen. Initially, generate. 
no well i don't want to share um, no 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 you share it um, now it's it's yeah. I, I am sharing it uh, <laughs> and mistake from uh, from i'm sorry yes now it's fine uh, now it's fine because uh, i don't know well, yeah, of course. I mean, um, we also can do, uh, we, we work with budgets, okay? And in the competition stage, you might not. And then once we, if we, if we get the, and oftentimes the decision is made by, by a jury or by a mayor or somebody falling in love with something. And I think what, what hit me home is that sometimes, uh, I, you know the investment in a in a in a beautiful, uplifting, and let's say hopeful space. Um, and I was thinking about this when I went to Isfahan. Might be the right way to spend. I don't know what you know. Let's say if if we do such a structure, and I was even thinking about something like the palace we're trying to design for Algiers on a beautiful um, site. It's, it becomes an object of pride, of visit where everybody can go get a piece of it. And if you take that budget and you distribute it across the population of, I don't know, my 20 million, uh, maybe that's not worth it. Maybe that's what they're burning through a year, but now you have generations of maybe citizens. And even if they're, the, they still might live in kind of poor conditions, uh, there's something uplifting. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, for major public sites, I wouldn't want to be stingy uh, you know, if I if if I get the chance to create something, and of course we have to be then very very clear about also um, uh, you know doing something solid and and, and durable, which can uh, withstand the, the test of time, uh, and that's also something which we need to be very aware of when when we build monuments like that. So I I don't know I don't know I don't know cost estimates, but of course you can also do beautiful things more temporary or, or cheaper. We've done a lot of tensile structures, but if you work with people like Philip Block, uh, for instance, on, on, um, on these stone structures and compression only vaults, and sometimes you can also do something in particular when it's not air conditioned, when we do with passive systems, which is very cost effective. Um, um, a lot of the, uh, these parametric structures we've been seeing they're very, very cost effective. Look at the work of Mark Fawns or a lot of our Afi Mengas, these pavilions. And something like this, and, and, and also the, all the temporary structures and pavilions we've created, um, uh, you can do a lot with that also. Particularly if you don't have to we have a sealed and air conditioned interior, then, then you don't have any, many, many layers of of, of construction, uh, but you have a beautiful uh, prefab element or, or a, uh, an used local labor. It's like also what, what uh, ZHA Code has been doing in India with, 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 with um, uh, integrating um, manual labor with, with digital tools. You get something which is potentially cost effective. I mean, it's not something you can cost in the normal way where you go to a market where they just, you know, freak out and can't do it. So, so, so that's something which is part of the research and I, it's an important point to make. I mean, and when we did the, the refugee and obviously that became uh, critical, uh, how would that be manufactured? Because we then wanted to make many of them. Um, so I'm, I can't give you, you know, it's very difficult. You can't calculate things because they're very, very um, uh, unique and innovative and different. And uh, you need to rely on enthusiastic, uh, let's say also um, uh, fabricators who, who want to come in to, to support in a project like that. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. course, when you do something in Dubai or Abu Dhabi, then you don't worry about that. Right. Yeah, for sure like that's i mean it's it's like a infinity budget there but i mean like now especially i mean in syria and for the other city and the country which is, has the post-war disaster i mean like it's a big challenge i mean in regard to the economy situation how we can like uh, of course like, yeah. feel that i mean for that reason i mean as you said i mean the processing and all these uh, all these sets i mean like that's how the people should be like change the mentality for them i mean like to get 
I mean, there are different problems. You know, what I was showing, let's say, there's a problem of, 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 of building basic infrastructures and basic housing units. You might do module and so on. That's one thing, and that gives hope, and, and, and it's a basic necessity. But if you want to get a place, you need to, you don't forget the symbolism. I mean, and, and you're living in a global world, and if you want to, if you want to kind of demonstrate to yourselves and the world that the place is back, you know, you know, I mean, whatever that might cost as a physical artifact, it might be in terms of the benefit of signaling that the place is back and safe and 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 optimistic for 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 trade to come back, for investment to come back, for for uh, you know um, the citizens who fled to come back. I mean, that's that's what I'm I would reflect. So. I'm, economy is not just cost. Economy is always a cost-benefit analysis, and that's often what's what's left out when, when when you when you criticize projects in terms of cost, because it's very difficult to calculate benefit. Right? Uh, these kind of intangible benefits of, of of a thrill, of an uplift, of an energizing of a whole place, of an institution, through this investment and. And I mean, um, and I think if you look at one of the, let's say, the biggest scandal of cost was in Hamburg, right? The Elk Philharmonie. You could have said, you know, you should have killed and fired and shut down. And but I think in 10, 20 years or well now, I mean, the pride and the and the kind of thrill of of having that, and 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 um, I think um, <laughs> the, the, these costs will be forgotten. Uh, you know that that instead of eating that up during those years through whatever consumption to have invested, uh, you know it's always like this. I mean, in the end, um, um, uh, if you don't invest in such places, it just disappears. It, we've consumed it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's clear now. Yeah, true. Thank you for answer. Like Prof. Karsten. <laughs> <and Yale. laughs> Yes, first of all, thank you very much for your super exciting uh, lecture that you gave us. And uh, I mean, my question is already kind of answered by what Zeebo was asking. Uh, as we are running the summer school um, in, in, in that very, let's say, uh, sensitive uh, context there in uh, Syria, um, of course, we're dealing with a very special situation. And at the same time, we also deal with a situation that gives us kind of a unique chance, of course as there are vast areas of destruction that can be replaced by something something new. And of course, you have shown us all these beautiful uh, projects doing something new in established contexts, sometimes maybe provocative. Uh, and um, now let's say, uh, getting to the point, that was what also Siwa already was asking, um, in, in, in that very context, um, uh, to, to create something that is affordable, and that is made maybe of the local materials or maybe even of the rubble that is existing in, in, at, at these sites. How do you think that uh, parametric uh, design, parametrism could, could help in that context? Well, of course, maybe also for the I, like, of the I like the idea of using the rubble. And if you have, you know, you, you, you mostly can scan these concrete beams or, or stones and 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 then some you know and then and then and then have an algorithms algorithm kind of puzzling this into some kind of wall i think that would be fascinating it would be beautiful it might also be cost effective um so there is a so so i i think that's where where you where um um parametrism is also so open with respect to morphologies which would come out of something like this and isn't doesn't want to kind of reduce things to a um, to, to some kind of preconceived form. It's a set of principles uh, which inherently allows for incomplete compositions to very irregular uh, forms, but also there's an optimization element. So, you, you, you know, this, this fits in with engineering intelligence and engineering tools and whatever these, the latest engineering tools bring forth in terms of morphologies, will already be aligned with the general aesthetic sensibilities parameters and promotes which is you know an interest and lust for complexity and the beauty and complexity and, and and variation but also then the kind of rigor which would come with an engineering logic uh, under the what we now call tectonism that would come in 
So I would, I, I think that's fascinating what you were talking about. I mean, uh, and I've seen pro interesting projects also where you go into, for instance, uh, for, for timber construction, you go into forest and you scan trees and you use the, the natural forks and, 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 and rugged, uh, let's say, dimensions. And you and and then and you can cope with that uh, because you can scan these pieces and you can you can you can assemble them into a new structure and maybe then you you have far less cutoffs far less wastage and you generate a new kind of beauty there. So so there will be another example of this way where we can actually integrate found objects and uh, both with respect to as a as a construction material as well as uh, as as spaces you kind of connect up with found objects and, and conditions you find and you you can you can work with these contingencies so i think that's very beautiful and it's very could be cost effective i mean um at the the the, uh, um, the because the cost of this information heavy but the cost of information is 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 gravitating to not to zero but <laughs> becomes relatively small yeah and even in information gained yeah. once and uh, categorized could be reused in in, in other yeah. situations uh, again later so zero marginal cost <laughs> exactly okay thank you very much I, th I think there are a lot of questions from 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 the audience in general so maybe we can Mahmoud how can we pass it on to to the audience Audiences questions? It's anonym questions, but uh, some students like such as Christoph uh, has uh, a question in the shade. Yeah. He has uh, written. Maybe he could uh, please uh, ask uh, personally. Christoph, Jeffries. Christoph, are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, first of all, for uh, all the insight um, of the different projects. Really um, interesting, especially also the ones which were not published and not being built. Um, my question is um, potential building material wood um, for parametric structures. Does that make any sense? Um, what are your... Um, contacts or have you ever come across projects? Yeah, well, we actually, we have a beautiful project uh, in England here for a football stadium, which we're proposing an all timber stadium. The first, when we first all timber stadium structure. And it's, it's, it's uh, also the, the, the facade will be timber, but also the structure of the actual board. And uh, so that got planning permission finally, and this is part of it also, this is a sense of green, it's a beautiful countryside location, and that helps to fit it in and make it palatable and, and acceptable, and, and it's also efficient material, I mean, it's, uh, as you all know, so, so and we are part of uh, a research, uh, some research initiatives was looking at, at timber, working together with also timber, companies uh, with respect to um, also taller structures in timber. And we had a number of times where we sketched uh, interesting, uh, some projects. So we had a beautiful project in Cambodia for a uh, center, uh, exhibition center and, and discussion center for the uh, Khmer Rouge genocide event there. And that was an all timber uh, uh, design. So, so we're very much interested in it because um, you can do beautiful things and you work, I mean, inherently the, this later stage of parametrism, which I call tectonism, works very much uh, with the morphologies which come out of material logics, engineering logics, fabrication logics, as also environmental logics, and uh, the, the, the various engineering cross tools and optimization uh, tools, and the way you would work with timber and consider the, you know, the, the the, the grain, or like I said earlier, and uh, its, its particular strengths and join potential to, to pay a lot of attention to that and make build that into the DNA of the project and generate morphologies uh, out of that. Um, it's very interesting to me. So the whole point here is for me in tectonism is the diversity you're getting. So, so that we could also mix materials and um, 
that you get uh, a congeniality because all of these um, logics, they share this idea of variation, of op you know, um, optimization through variation, but they have particular geometry. So if you look at uh, compression only shells versus uh, reinforced shells with all sort of tensile operations versus tensile structures versus curved folding with sheet materials. They all have, um, and all of them can operate on irregular in free, inverted commas freeform site and program conditions, but they're all, they have their own character. It's not only anymore the kind of nerve surface the Maya modeling, but we have very particular morphologies they share something, they're also distinct, and timber has something distinct, and steel structures, um, and various ways of using steel, for instance, in, with sheet material, will have a particular constraint, a particular uh, characterfulness, and that's very important for articulating the built environment, because we have to overcome the kind of monotony, but we also have to overcome this kind of strange cacophony. So I'm looking for the kind of complex variegate order we can get if we have permanism slash tectonism, uh, uh, and we generate a lot of a, a variety and variation. For instance, in a large project we have to do, we can't work with one pony, uh, as it were, uh, trick a whole kind of Google campus or something. That would be problematic. So we would have to bring in all the various uh, and multiple languages, and they should be rational, and probably they should all be based somehow in a, in a tectonic material logic as well, of course, in terms of programmatic logics, and they need to be matching up, as well as our environmental logic, how we would shade uh, a volume, etc. So this is for me very important. That's why we, as we're interested also in new fabrication, I mean, as well, uh, like 3D printing in, in concrete, and that's a different morphology than the traditional reinforced concrete, uh, where you have to work with sheets and foam work, and if you 3D print, you get the factura of the, of the tool path and you get very different constraints again and that's all welcome so for, i'm emphasizing an architect who's interested in articulation and um and um communication therefore of, of the architecture to have that palette of uh, rigorous and let's say uh, robust communication as large as possible so uh, that's for me that therefore the meaning is not let's do everything from now on in wood but let's let's have a, a whole a, a large palette of op opportunities and options, um, including things like you know even kind of carbon fiber perhaps or composite shells etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's what I like about permetism. It kind of connects up this fabrication research as well as material research. And with three D printing, we're getting into a very interesting domain. We're now working with a great with a very beautiful company who's 3D printing directly without foam work, uh, straight lines of steel into space and be generating a boat with them and they have created this bridge. So, 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 so that, that, as well as the idea of, of having kind of differ, internally differentiated materials printed, where they, where they become kind of uh, uh, more dense in some areas and more uh, less than than others, so they have different thermal qualities, qualities of strengths, this kind of gradient transformation of material qualities. You know, there's very exciting uh, research, and, and timber is just one um, um, in very interesting element because you can do many different things. You can do, you know, massive timber and various kind of engineered timbers, laminated, of course. Well, so I don't think uh, that on the research front we should be. Um, um, I mean, each of you as individual researchers should specialize, but as a, as a discourse, we should, we, sh we should open up to, to many directions. Mahmoud, like, do you want like, to start like the other, the second question? So, uh, I would like to ask if uh, Herr Schumacher or if he had time, also if, if you have a time um, for two, three yeah, questions no, no, from have, our uh, students. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. cool. Um, oh. Also, we will start as a, uh, one student has asking, um, 
um, from Colombia uh, regarding the budget. So you are uh, suggesting that the parametric architecture is available at least now specifically for a monumental or institutional buildings around the world. What about housing or residence control budget projects? But the response of parametric architecture to that is that there are some built examples. No, but we we currently working actually on uh, student housing in Hong Kong, which is very very bare 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 basics. <laughs> it's stripped bare. And we're trying to do something interesting you know, with the modular elements, and we have a very curious condition. We're exploiting the topography, so you can actually access the building on over the roof. And we can use all the roofs and then go down into the tower or into the buildings. So they're actually big slabs, creating courtyards, etc. So it's it's a tough uh, to 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 do something which doesn't become oppressive in its let's say monotony and endless kind of seriality, uh, which you would have uh, if you had a big student housing complex in in, in modernist character. And we're fighting that with with variations. So I believe that in in housing, yes. The other thing we're doing is um, working with the collective on co-living, and this is this is even more beautiful. We get a lot of shared spaces, a lot of you know free co-working, and and uh, on each floor shared spaces, and also globally shared spaces and so on. And working also with modular elements there. The, 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 what we're what we're trying to develop is where we're relying on the base module, and then but still want to put variation. Maybe have not only one but several plugging on winter gardens or balconies which differentiate again this or what you you know putting two together to make larger units and making a gap and adding a, a kind of outdoor space next to one unit and so you have you also there i think we don't want um you know endless seriality particularly also when it comes to low cost housing low cost uh, and housing People don't are all exactly the same. They're not all kind of the typical three people family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a whole range of you know extended families and smaller families and lots of singles. And also there, and because I don't, I believe in markets and free markets, and I think the market could deliver very, very effective low cost housing, very affordable. And there you wouldn't necessarily have everybody exactly the same. You know, if you if you if you come in rational from the state, you actually have to deliver the same standard, and that makes everything the same. Actually, far too big. <laughs> it's sort of very wasteful in a way. Not given away because it's actually bigger and 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 more regulated than than the private market is delivering and would deliver. So so I think there could be a lot of variation, and parameterism would participate want to participate in uh, in these kind of low cost ventures and we would want to bring that idea of variation adaptation tailoring and customization because that's the whole thing it's mass customization uh, um, and that's what we're working on it can be delivered once you're 3d printing i mean of course you can do these variations okay if you build modular but you can have you can have of course variations and games of combination with pieces so that's the kind of things we're doing research on we in at drl and we're also trying i mean it's not easy for us i mean we are kind of um, um sitting in the center of london we're not the cheapest architects in the world in terms of our design time but we're trying we went, I went out to albania and we're trying to to see what we can do for clients and the, the, the costs there i mean I, they are, you can't imagine how low these costs are there. i mean it's also and uh, so, so the, if, we, if you want any fees, it's, it's, it's ending up a, a, a too large a fraction of the investment. We still want to do it. So, so we are very interested in that, in all that. And we don't want to. Uh, I mean, parametrism isn't a luxury file. I mean, it's a universal, <laughs> as universalizing aspirations, of course, uh, and principles which are applicable globally and across all products products and project uh, domains and all kind of levels when it comes to large mixed use the complexity of inner cities and so on that's where you can we can show up most our potency but i think it would be it should be um, uh, universally promoted why shouldn't everybody have a piece of that
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question from Abdurrahman Farra. Maybe I will let him unmute. As we can, as we know that uh, one of the main consequences of the war that of the conflict that uh, people lose their work and people are looking for the reconstruction phase as an opportunity to get their work back. But how can the parametric, uh, the re-parametric, uh, I mean the parametric, and how can it uh, like give people work with all of the need of the digital fabrication? How can this give work to the local labors in Syria? I mean. Well, I think that's, that's a very interesting opportunity because um, I think you need to, uh, it would be great. I mean, it, it what is great about the, the kind of parametric fabrication universe, it's a lot of young people, startups who can go in there and train people up and work with locals like ZH Code has been doing, there's many others. And uh, I think what, what Amatia Kohli are also showing recently that you, that, I mean, in a way you can, Parametrism can be, become a new kind of craft culture, ties in with the new craft culture, particularly if you have young people. And actually to get into the tools and get into the techniques is maybe quicker than the kind of traditional learning curve of a carpenter or something very complex. I mean, to have a proper trade, building trade, is not you have to learn a long time as well. Um, and uh, so I think the learning curve is required. But what a lot of these, I mean, um, Ex examples show is that you could integrate manual with 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 digital labor um, very nicely so instance when you bring in a robot onto site the robot might just actually point or place or, or give you the geometric location in spoils and then you come in and lay that brick at that point or you bring in that uh, it might be uh, it's, that's the way actually Amazon and Kohl are using robots or using you know AR overlay so that you can you, you would have you rely on 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 manual labor but working with the precision of a more complex digital model with the, with some kind of digital aids on site um, and I think that's 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 important so that, you know you have to remember that that um it, these kind of jobs if, if if you have kind of five years of reconstruction uh and and you 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 just say because we have uh, we have to give kind of uh, certain laborers uh, a maximum amount of work to do i think that's false because you lock people into this and when after this is all done they have nowhere to go so <laughs> we it's, it's very important to weave into kind of new skills, new technologies. And even if, if the overall required labor force is less than if you do it more traditionally, those who have been part of that have, you know, have been empowered for the next stage because then you have new outfits there of uh, paramedically and robotically kind of skilled up um, local contractors who can then kind of venture out and have a more high value process and pay better salaries and and and, and etc cetera, etc cetera. i think it's very very it, it, danger is always to 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 think of in any ways curbing technology with with the argument that this would undermine labor and undermine work i mean it also sets free people to do other things so if, if less people are tied up in construction and more can go into other areas and i think it's very very false you have actually in germany we created this kind of zombie economy when the, the problem is that you have full employment and people are employed in kind of subsidized industries uh, zero interest rate um, um uh, keeping uh, preventing actually bankruptcies preventing an, an a healthy flow of of uh, unemployed so that actually startup companies and new ventures have kind of resources to bring on so I don't know, I mean, if you, even in a condition like Syria, as I said, I would say um, it is, you know, maybe, maybe you bring in the technology and employ the workers and you get everything done faster. And then you can do other things. So I, I'm, I'm highly skeptical about, about um, uh, if, if employment um, uh, issues are brought in as an argument against innovate, technological innovation. Thank Makes you. Me very uh, 
the, the next question is from Faisal UK. I let him. Um, yes, uh, hi, Patrick. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, it was amazing. Um, I'm a big fan of your theories and parametricism and sort of everything you talk about. And um, when, when I think about post-war architecture, uh, psychology comes to mind and sort of the, the dimension of sort of a healing and uh, you know, therapy of architecture. So I wanted to ask, how do you sort of um, incorporate that within your project of parametric semiology? Since uh, parametric semiology is heavily based on things like just our psychology and, and, and you know, um, sort of the perception of, of humans within architecture. So I'm wondering if you've sort of thought about the therapeutic, therapeutic aspect of it as well. Um, frankly, I haven't, that, I haven't been confronted with that, with that issue. So, so um, and we actually haven't uh, literally uh, gone with this. I'm not sure if, if um, I mean, I mentioned, I started with that image from, from um, uh, Berlin. I mean, there's this kind of memory and recognition also of, of the destruction I mean, but, but this, these are these are local moments, a singular symbolic moments. Uh, I don't know if you, if the um, uh, perhaps for the for the most of the city fabric is the the best is to to kind of make good uh, and 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 as if as you know as if this didn't have happened and you can have a kind of fresh start and forget the the traumas to some extent. I mean, at, at some point and some moment, uh, you, some of these fragments should remain also in terms of, for instance, in Berlin with respect to the pieces of the wall. I do appreciate that there's, there should be some kind of fragments left uh, and then we don't kind of become oblivious about this. So that's one aspect in terms of cultural memory. Uh, so, so I think that's, that there might, I don't know the particulars. Um, um, I think that, that uh, this, that there should be something, uh, but I haven't thought about it, the trauma of war and so on, and if that means that um, that one has to have a different architecture in this context. I'm skeptic. I think probably not. Um, it sometimes it's it's really crazy how 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 you get into these kind of civil wars or or wars. I mean, I I was so shocked, uh, and and then it seems to be it comes out of nowhere. It's maybe very it's, it's 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 within all of us when we get into in these kind of extreme situation of escalation, but it's not something which stays necessarily. For instance, when I was visually uh, experiencing this was in the uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, with respect to the breakdown of Yugoslavia, where you had um, a very kind of sophisticated and civilized society. Uh, breaking up into you know a menacing brutality, and the images which were circulating were unbelievable to us because we also knew quite a lot of people from Yugoslavia and the people who actually live in London. They couldn't believe what happened to their peers, their friends. And uh, then you you go back, and um, now and this is totally forgotten, and and you don't you know it's it's, it's very quickly actually you can get out of it. It's like a kind of bad nightmare. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so I don't know if this, re and yet again, they do have one of those kind of ruins in the middle of the city, for instance, in Zagreb, where we have all these kind of um, uh, projectiles kind of created a Swiss cheese out of this, out of this concrete wall. And, you know, it's, <laughs> That's maybe healthy sometimes, but you really want to, you don't want to have that in your face every day. I don't know what, if you have an answer, but, but my suspicion is that, that um, this nightmare is over and you, wake, you, you have to find normality. And then this, is, this isn't something which you have to kind of dwell on and, and ponder and, and be scared of going forward. Right. Uh, uh, can I just ask a, a follow-up yeah. question to that? Um, yeah. Is it possible to sort of embed um, psychological parameters to agents when doing this sort of simulations in agent-based crowd modeling? 
Is it possible to sort of embed different uh, parameters? Well, yes. I mean, the one thing we're working on is, is more, uh, uh, for instance, legibility capacity. So, so um, um, can you decompose a complex scene? Can you uh, pattern recognition, let's say? That will be more the kind of psychology of perception. We haven't done that, but we, 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 we can. There is a capacity to try to do that. And otherwise, psychology, yes, to some extent, you, you could, um, because you differentiate the agent, um, they could have, um, we already have different um, um, internal states. They're more like simplistic states. So that you, for instance, if you had been uh, in a condition where nobody has disturbed you and you've been able to concentrate in, in, in the environment, you, you actually quite like, you're more receptive. So you, you're increased, your, your desire maybe to communicate and be interrupted or the receptiveness to being approached. Uh, and so that when, when these kind of agents which haven't had a lot of communication in the day yet, meet each other, they, they strike a communication. And those who had been already uh, talking for most of the day and the, the urgency to go back to some concentrated work, they will kind of avoid each other. So these are inter internal states which we simulate. And they're, they're more about, um, let's say, we allow the historical experience or the, let's say the daily experience, the accumulation of events, affect the internal state. So the receptivity and the, and the probability of, of doing, uh, reacting to certain stimulus in certain ways. So that's the one way to do it. Another way, in fact, we haven't implemented in our models or um, in 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 so sort of that, that research we've been doing is uh, based on the in the firms, Adi Architects, as well as in Vienna at the Angewandte in the in the research in the PhD group. And there was somebody who where we had we differentiate the um, the um, crowd with respect to psychological types, particularly the introvert extrovert condition. And I think that's something, and and there's a kind of uh, certain personality distributions one can presume in the in the in the population, and that might be of interest because, particularly in terms of corporate uh, change management and corporate culture evolution development, one could work with and put one, one could uh, have the if this part of a realism on the one hand, you could have introverts and extroverts. and then you could have the agenda that you you worry that the introverts are insufficiently integrated that a lot of the knowledge they have is bottled up and not coming out and their potential isn't developed so how can you you can kind of track <laughs> that and then you can kind of try to see whether you with, with interventions and mechanisms you could get uh, uh, the introverts you know more exposed to to extroverts so that they can actually and, and avoid introverts <laughs> mixing with introverts Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, 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 so. Thanks for the question. I mean, that was actually one of the um, one of the researchers uh, was actually working on that, and I think that's uh, that's a good point. So, um, yes. So it's individual moods which accumulate, and let's say propensities as internal. But definitely, it comes through the you know this idea of internal states and. And, uh, and decision making processes and moods and psychological character, let's say, conditions obviously can be represented through, in the end, of course, it's a kind of behaviorism. It has to show up in behavior. Uh, and that, but of course, only then it is of us interested anyway to get into psychology if that becomes some kind of a lever on behaviors. And that's, and that's, that, that's a kind of part of the research. Right? So, so, yes. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for the answer. Thank you. So, uh, we have, uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, Patrick. Uh, I would like to, 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 to be thankful for your time. Um, but uh, some students would like to, to ask more questions. I don't know how, <laughs> how, long, how long you have time. Let's, let's uh, do it. Yeah, one more question, uh, because I'm four o'clock. OK. Something to say. I would. I, I don't know. Uh, we have also only two last questions from okay. Lisa Moreno and uh, Lisa. I don't know who will will be begin with the question, but I will let uh, Lisa. You would like to ask? Yeah. Um. I had to think about the 
big plans the planners in post war second world war germany had for all the wastelands that um, were created within the war and a lot of this big dreams and also the the structures or the buildings they built in that time are kind of the the wastelands of today the ruins and um, they're vacant and nobody uses them anymore and i was thinking uh, when when i looked at your or at the projects you showed us um how would you prevent your big dreams of today um of becoming the ruins of the future well i don't know if i can prevent that i mean um I don't know about which exact projects you're talking about and whether they were kind of still born out of the, or whether they had an initial life cycle, which was then um, um, coming to an end. And I, I probably it was the latter. And, uh, and that has to do with a major historical shift. Um, so, which I'm discussing in, the, in terms of the, the transition from a Fordist reproduction regime to a post-Fordist, which is much more dynamic and brought us kind of urban uh, renaissance and convergence. And um, so, so um, modernism and these, these kind of uh, planned estates, I mean, there were some project at the origins of this, so some people predicted that already, like, um, um, the great American uh, female architectural theorist and libertarian economist um, who wrote uh, The Life and Death of the Great American Cities, she, um, she predicted some of the problems, but I think the, the, the real problem surfaced uh, when we're coming into the, into the 80s and 90s. Uh, it's a bit like why, this, why the GDR uh, couldn't continue because there was a totally new societal dynamic uh, which wanted also new spaces and new um, uh, architectures and that's what made these structures obsolete so so no um, architecture is and by the way prior to that in America you can see for instance a lot of uh, inner city uh, became kind of semi-obsolete in that great move to the suburbs and now it's been, the inverse is happening now these kind of suburban satellite cities are dying <laughs> and everybody's moving and, and sometimes whole cities and regions are dying the rust belt and detroit and so on so i don't think there is um we need to analyze how much of that is um some kind of an, an inherent problem in the architecture or it's a more in the architecture was actually quite well adapted to a particular historical era and let's say life process and then that as a life process changes some of those structures will become obsolete we have to live with that i mean uh, i don't think for instance um some of the things we're proposing um, I mean, those things we're proposing in the very center of major cities, I mean, they're going to be reused because there's little risk there of, but some of things on outskirts, yes, maybe they will get, they kind of fall off the, the you know, the ut utility and, I mean, the big, the big transformation I foresee, I mean, at the moment, I think this condition of post-forest network society will continue. But should there be this kind of transition into much, much more intensive uh, reliance on uh, telecommunication and electronic media and less face-to-face, uh, -face, far less face-to-face, -face, if that would come to pass, then uh, we have another, you know, big process of adjustment and readjustment of of, of spaces and some some spaces might. And, and real estate projects might go bankrupt or may fall into disuse. Uh, and I think my answer to this is, and nobody can know and nobody can prevent it uh, when it happens, but what we have done, we have to be ready to be, be very, very ready to, to, to adjust, adapt, potentially tear down and rebuild or, uh, or adopt and adapt. And for that, 
what we need most of all is, I think, a relatively open and free society where, where there where isn't too many regulations getting in the way of discovering the new urban patterns and, and, and preferences. Um, but yeah, I, I think that maybe that, that transition uh, from Fordism to post-Fordism was quite dramatic. And you can see it with the total collapse of the whole kind of Eastern Bloc, the socialist models, the central plant models, and also all the European, Western European central planning kind of regimes like you had in Britain and in Sweden and so on. The disappearance of all of that means we really went into, we've gone through an epochal shift nearly as big as the first industrial revolution and that changed everything. So I'm not sure if we have, if we've, we experience another one in my lifetime or in the next 50 years. So, so maybe not, maybe we don't have to have, but we will not have such, perhaps such a dramatic transformation. Thank you. Okay. The last okay. question is from uh, Diaz Moreno. This is not a familiar name for me, but uh, um, I will let him. Yeah, this is um, Efren Garcia Green and Cristina Diaz Moreno from Madrid and Vienna. Um, as um, thank you for the presentation, by the way, uh, we would like in a completely different page. We would like to ask you about the situation at the Architectural Association. What do you think about it? Uh, do you support Eva Frank in, in his position? What do you think about the letter that many um, U.S. academics wrote about this situation? Thank you very much. Oh, well. I'm I mean, we were all in lockdown. I mean, I haven't, I've, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen a lot of the, the correspondence or letters you've been talking about. Um, and um, I know some about some of the frustrations which might have led to this. I think it was quite brutal to be, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. I mean, the A is a very unique place and um, there's a thrill about it. It's, it's, it's kind of radical democratic potentials. I mean, with respect to student empowerment, student staff and the community, basically student staff can can do that. They can vote in new deans and um, terminate all deans. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, that is exciting, but we also have to be, I think when, um, we shouldn't get overexcited about it sometimes. I, I don't know, to be quite frank, um, whether this was uh, was 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 a good idea or uh, was was mandated, I I um, um, can't help you. Maybe you tell me what you think. Um, from I, mean, I don't know if you're at the AA or you're an outside voice. Give me give me your take. I'm happy to listen to it. My and so I've not made up my mind at all. But it seems quite it's a tough tough thing. But maybe when you get into the AA, you know what what you might have to face. <laughs> Cool. Thank you very much for your time, Herr uh, Schumacher, and uh, for the interesting presentation. I am, this is my pleasure to to meet uh, uh, each other in, uh, in also in Hamburg or in Syria. Um, would you like to say, say some things, Ewa, uh, as I end uh, our uh, section? No, thank you very much. I mean, like Patrick, I mean, like super nice and it's interesting. And I mean, sorry for also delay, but you know, also it's a big chance for all of us. I mean, like uh, instead to enter, okay, like parametric design, it's a big field. I mean, like, so I mean, like now we have here the godfather of parametricism. So it's super nice. I mean, like to hear like directly from you, I mean, the question. And that's, I mean, it's a big chance for all us. I mean, like, and we hope also like we will have you in the another lecture or another session or another things i mean and also like from now also i hope like we will have you like in the jury i mean also to see also the final result that's what it would be in like in 15 of july so i mean like just i am inviting you in public so but it would be super okay. interesting yeah let's send me the let me invite yes yes i would send it to you yeah well, thank you for, for your interest guys and keep it up Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know. See. Bye -bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao.